So good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks for coming to today's colloquium. Let me briefly introduce uh, today's speaker, Professor Thomas Schäfer from North Carolina State University. Thomas did his uh, uh, graduate studies back in Germany, finishing with a PhD in 1992 uh, at uh, Regensburg uh, University. He then went uh, on a Humboldt Fellowship to Stony Brook University from, as a postdoc from 92 to 95. Um, he did another postdoc at the INT in Seattle from 95 to 98, and then from 98 to 2000 worked with uh, Frank Wilczek at uh, the IAS in Princeton. That was a couple of years before Frank got his uh, Nobel Prize in 2004. Um, at that point, uh, in 2000, um, he uh, was offered an assistant professorship at uh, Stony Brook in conjunction with a uh, written b and uh, fellowship position, which were created uh, to provide uh, theoretical support for, for rig physics. He stayed in Stony Brook for uh, three years. He got the DOE Junior Investigator Award there uh, before moving to North Carolina State in 2003 um, as associate professor. At that point, he became... Um, full professor in 2006, and uh, a few years ago, five years ago, distinguished professor in 2012 uh, at uh, NC State. Um, Thomas of, uh, is an APS fellow and um, has uh, served on very uh, various uh, high-level uh, committees, which I spare you uh, discussing here. Um, I think one of the remarkable, one of the uh, many remarkable features of uh, Thomas's research is that it's, it's really very broad. And that is uh, also what is uh, reflected in the title today. Uh, so we are very happy that he came here. Um, so let me hand it over to him. Not before handing you a little gift which you can use in your presentation. So let's welcome uh, Thomas. Yeah, so this almost reminds me I remember in Princeton, we had to sit through many seminars with famous speakers where the introduction would always take up 25 minutes because they had so many honors. I remember I once went to one of these talks where after this 20-minute introduction, the speaker said, you know, you forgot to mention that I'm also very modest. <laughs> okay, well, thank you so much, and thank you for having me. It's my first time here, and I'm enjoying it greatly. Um, so this story is again about these connections between cold atomic physics and the physics of the quark gluon plasma. And at least to me, the story begins about 15 years ago when at Brookhaven, after the heavy ion program started, they handed out these coffee mugs. And you can't see what it says here, but I say it again up on top. So it says, Rick serves the perfect fluid. And uh, given that it's on a coffee mug, of course, it has to be right. And so roughly speaking, what they meant when they put it on the coffee mug is something like this, that there was always a concern that heavy ion collisions were just too goddamn complicated to run anything, that the system was incredibly far from equilibrium, and it was a quantum system that was strongly correlated, that it wasn't really infinitely many particles, it was just a few. But it was always a concern that maybe the system would be too complicated. And in some sense, the good news in these heavy ion collisions at RIC and at the LHC was that a lot of the phenomena could be understood by a very simple theory. And the simple theory is indeed a very old theory. It's the theory that everything flows. Okay? And it goes back to the 5th century BC. And so in, in this talk, what I really want to address is why that is. So everything flows means fluid dynamics is a good first order description of the system. So I want to address why this works. And I want to address how general the phenomenon is that you can use this very simple theory of fluid dynamics to describe a system that's superficially very short-lived and very far from equilibrium and very small. Okay. So for that purpose, you know, this being a colloquium, I want to start very general and remind you of a bunch of fairly simple things that I think are still quite beautiful and worth reminding people of. So number one, I want to remind you that hydrodynamics is indeed a much more general theory than we generally give it credit for. So the undergraduate version of what 
hydrodynamics is, is that it's simply Newton's equation as applied to some kind of deformable medium. And my point number one is that hydro is indeed a much more general thing, that hydro, what it really is, what I call the postmodern definition of hydrodynamics, is a general effective theory of any non-equilibrium system provided you look at it on sufficiently long scales and over sufficiently long times. And the general idea is really quite simple that you know in physics we do experiments by perturbing the system in some way and then we see it respond. And there are really two kinds of perturbations that if you have a perturbation in some quantity that's not a conserved density, then the perturbation can always relax locally and that will happen on some time scale. That's just a microscopic time scale. It's the time scale for atoms to collide or for electrons to collide or quarks. And that can in general be quite short. However, if you make a perturbation in anything that's a conserved density, then it can't just locally relax because it's a conserved charge. It has to diffuse or propagate out. And that will take longer and longer the larger the wavelength of that perturbation is. So these modes are then special because if you look at long wavelength modes, they will take longer and longer to relax. So if you look at long wavelength modes, you only have to look at these and you can in some sense forget about those because they've already relaxed. And so that's the basic observation behind hydrodynamics that if you look at non-equilibrium behavior, but you look at sufficiently long times, then all you truly need to know is what are the conserved charges in the system and what are their symmetries. And that's the idea of fluid dynamics. And so in the case historically, of course, the system that was studied first was just water. And in the case of water, the conserved charges are simply the total mass of the fluid or the total number of particles, the energy density and the momentum density of the fluid. So what we then do in fluid dynamics, we simply write down that these things are conserved. So there's a bunch of conservation laws. You know, the change in the density is the divergence of some kind of current. The change in the energy density is the divergence again of some kind of current. We can call it the energy current. And the change in the density of momentum is again the divergence of some kind of current, except that momentum density already has an index. So that current is now some kind of matrix. And so this current has a name, it's usually called the stress tensor. And it's this last equation that of course is in some sense sort of F equals MA, because if you think of an ordinary fluid, this is kind of mass times acceleration and on the right hand side there's some kind of force. Now, this looks like a kind of complete description, but it's not truly complete until you actually know what these currents are. And so the formal name for that is that you have to provide constitutive relations of how the currents are related to the properties of the system. Now again, we make use of the fact that we live in the long wavelength limit. And so in the long wavelength limit, I can always take these currents and just expand them in gradients. And I can expand them in gradients of these local charges, which are my hydrodynamic variables. So what one does in fluid dynamics is you just write down the most general expression for these currents that you can think of, provided they're expressed in terms of local charges and they expand it in gradients. And so for the stress tensor then, you write down terms with no derivatives, you write down terms with one derivative and two derivatives and so on. And all you do is you implement all the symmetries of the system. And so here I wrote it down for a non-relativistic system where the symmetries are just Galilean and rotation invariant. And then for example, it turns out that in this particular thing, the terms with no derivatives at all are completely fixed by symmetries. They just contain the pressure and the density of the system but the terms with one derivative, they have an overall unknown coefficient. And these kind of unknown coefficients are called transport coefficients. And if you know nothing about the system, you just have to go out and measure them. Okay. So in the stress tensor, strictly speaking, by the way, there's two, there's one that's called shear viscosity. And there's another one that's a kind of trace term that didn't fit on my transparency that's called bulk viscosity. And then there's term with more and more of these derivatives. Now then for the theory to make sense, you need, an you need to use the fact that this expansion actually truncates. So it must somehow be true that this term that you neglected is smaller than the ones that you kept. So the theory will only work if this expansion actually holds, if the terms with no derivatives are bigger with the, than the ones with one derivative and so on. 
So the expansion parameter in the theory is then the ratio of the terms with derivatives over the terms with no derivatives. And so here's this expansion parameter, it's viscosity times derivatives of velocity over the kind of inertial terms without derivatives. And that has a name, it's for funny historical reasons called inverse Reynolds number, the expansion parameter of the theory. So I used to have an upside down picture of Reynolds on this, but it always gave me kind of vertigo, so I put it, put it back up. So this is then a dimensionless ratio, and it needs to be much less than one for the theory to work. Okay. Now this dimensionless ratio, it contains properties of the fluid, like what is its density and what is its viscosity, as well as properties of the flow. And so you can kind of try to unpack it into things that only depend on the fluid and things that depend on the flow. Now, if you unpack it in this way, the two factors are no longer dimensionless, but they both have dimensions of an action. And in physics, there's a sort of natural way to make things that have factors, you know, dimensions of an action dimensionless, you divide by h bar. So this is what I did here. I factored out a fluid property which had units of action, but I factored it out in units of h bar, and this is a property of the flow, and I factored out units of h bar. So I need this thing to be less than one for fluid dynamics to work. So if you do fluid dynamics in your bathtub, then roughly speaking, the reason it works is because this factor, you know, this is a kind of classical flow, it involves large motion of the fluid. It's obviously not quantum. So that's in units of h bar, this is a giant number. And then you actually don't care what this factor is, fluid dynamics will work no matter what. And so roughly speaking, what's new with the heavy ions and these ultra small cold atomic gases is that we're taking fluid dynamics to the extreme. We're taking it to the place where this factor is now of order one the flow itself is kind of quantum. And then for fluid dynamics to work, this viscosity factor in front, that has to be quantum too. Now it has to be smaller than one. And so my kind of working definition of what I mean by nearly perfect fluid is simply systems for which this parameter is less than one so that we can drive the fluid dynamics all the way into sort of quantum limit of really, really small systems or really rapidly evolving systems. So viscosity is an endlessly amusing thing, and I cannot resist to make some general remarks about viscosity. So number one, there is of course a sort of textbook undergraduate definition of viscosity, and the particular flow that's usually used in this context is simple sheared flow between two plates. Okay? And you can actually, that's a two-line exercise to solve momentum conservation in this limit, because it's a stationary flow, so the time derivative vanishes, you shear it in the x direction, so this term vanishes as well, and there is no gradients to pressure, it's a completely static flow. So we have to make this term vanish, which simply means that the flow profile is linear. It's one line solution of a maybe a Stokes equation. So we get a linear flow profile, and you can then compute the stress tensor on the plates, which is the force that you have to provide in order to sustain that flow. And that force will simply be proportional to the area of the plates, the gradient of the flow, and this viscosity parameter. And that's the kind of Newtonian definition that you shear a fluid between two plates, you measure the force on the plates, and the constant of proportionality is called viscosity. Okay, that's little remark number one. Little remark number two is, again, in general, you may just have to measure what viscosity is. But if you know something about the fluid, then of course you can try to compute it too. And the simplest case of knowing something about the fluid is to know that it's made of particles in some sense. And if it's made of particles, then there's another theory that's slightly more microscopic than fluid dynamics that's called kinetic theory. And that goes back to Boltzmann and Maxwell and people like this. And it's based on the idea that these conserved densities can be expressed as distributions of particles. So we imagine that there's a distribution of particles in space and momentum, and then the conserved densities are just integrals of momentum of that, or the conserved energies are integrals of momentum weighted by the energy of the particle and so on. And then Boltzmann proposed that there was some kind of equation of motion for that distribution function, and that the distribution function can change because the particles are obviously moving, that's sometimes called a drift term or a streaming term, 
or it can change because the particles are scattering. But if they're scattering, a particle with some momentum can scatter off of some other particle and change its momentum. Okay? So in this kind of description, what is the source of viscosity? The source of viscosity is the fact that if you take the picture we had on the last slide of some kind of sheared flow, then microscopically what that now means is that the particles in the regime where the fluid is flowing faster are on average moving faster, and the particles where the velocity is slower are moving slower. So the thing that wants to equalize these velocities, that's the friction in the fluid, is simply the fact that the fast particles, since they're scattering around, they will slowly diffuse into the regime where the fluid is moving slower, and that will equalize the velocity. So viscosity is simply the rate at which that happens, it's the rate of momentum diffusion. And the rate of momentum diffusion is simply how many particles are there that are doing the diffusing, how much momentum do they carry with them on average, and how far do they get in between scattering. And so the simple kind of Maxwellian estimate of viscosity is simply the product of these three quantities. And there's a little geometric factor of a third that again, we worked that out in kind of undergraduate thermal. Okay, so that's a very simple formula, but it has all sorts of confusing properties. So the first one is, is if you now take a sort of, again, simple kinetic estimate of what a mean free pass is, it goes as one over the density of the fluid times some kind of cross-section. So if you put that together, then the viscosity goes as some kind of mean momentum divided by a cross-section, and it's actually totally independent of density and anything else. And so it was apparently Maxwell who discovered that and who announced that this is very, very startling because we're talking about friction after all, and clearly if there's more stuff, there should be more friction. And so he announced that this was really, really very startling, and he tried to look for an experiment that might confirm it, and he couldn't find one. And so he set out to do one himself. And so basically what he did is he took a pendulum. It was not an, actually it was a torsion pendulum, which is why the thing looks the way it does. He took a pendulum in air, and in air then the main source, if you build a sufficiently good pendulum, the main source of damping is just friction in air. And according to his theory, if you start to pump out the air, the friction should not actually decrease. It should stay the same. And he found that very counterintuitive, but he checked it, and it's indeed true. Now, what is also true is that there is a sort of order of limits issue here, because obviously, if you pump out the, the last air molecule, then there's no friction anymore. So at some point, initially it's constant, and at some point it collapses. That collapses the breakdown of hydrodynamics as an effective theory. But in the regime where hydrodynamics is applicable, indeed, viscosity is independent of density. What is also amusing is that the non-interacting limit is kind of counterintuitive. Again, the cross-section is in the denominator. So if you take the cross-section to zero, you make the viscosity infinitely large. That, too, is kind of confusing. You're reducing the interaction strength and you're getting more friction because, you know, we think of friction as pulling on stuff, and that's exactly the other way around. So that's indeed because our intuition is shaped by things that are not typical gases or fluids. It's sort of shaped by honey and stuff like this where there's actual pulling. So an ordinary fluid, again, viscosity is how easily you can rearrange momentum, and that's driven by collision. So the non-interacting limit is actually the limit of infinite viscosity. And again, there's a sort of order of limits thing here. Obviously, if you have infinite viscosity in an extremely dilute gas, fluid dynamics actually no longer applies. So the strongly interacting limit is then the limit in which viscosity becomes small. And there's another observation about this that's kind of quite old, which is that if you look at the ratio of viscosity over density, which is again this thing that has units of action, that in kinetic theory is mean momentum times mean free pass. And then you're sort of tempted to say, oh, that looks a little bit like the uncertainty relation. So maybe quantum mechanics actually puts a kind of limit on this, that this is not allowed to become much smaller than H bar. So it could be true that indeed these perfect fluids where you get fluid dynamics and the kind of quantum limit are only sort of on the border. They're sort of barely allowed by quantum mechanics. Now, that's not a rigorous argument, obviously, because the argument uses a kind of kinetic theory formula, which is sort of classical, 
and then we sort of brute force take it into the quantum regime, and then we make some kind of hand wavy argument about the uncertainty relation. So it was unclear whether you should believe this argument, and indeed they're kind of counterexamples to these sorts of arguments in other systems. So, um, so that's, where it's, that's where it stood for a while, and then something amusing happened, which is that people started to think about what is superficially a totally different system. So this was supposed to be some kind of black hole, and this is an irreversible process where I take a hammer, a piece of rock or something, and I throw it into the black hole, and of course it doesn't come out. So this is some irreversible process in which the entropy of the universe somehow increases and the reverse does not happen. That's at least somewhat analogous already to kind of viscosity because viscosity again is irreversible damping of motion in a fluid. Now what was discovered is that the analogy actually goes a little bit further than that. So you can study this process in more detail and in particular, you can kind of study the end of it, that you have an excited black hole and it slowly settles down to a slightly larger black hole. When the whole black hole settles down, and that's now of course actually observed kind of experimentally, it does this sort of ringing in the end, sometimes called quasi-normal ringing. And it was discovered some years ago that that's of course described by completely classical ordinary general relativity that in this limit, you can describe the solutions of Einstein's equation in a simpler picture where you pretend that the black hole has some kind of actual membrane that stretches over the event horizon and that membrane behaves as if it was a viscous two-dimensional fluid. And then you get the solutions to the Einstein equation by assigning a viscosity to that two-dimensional membrane and the correct viscosity that reproduces the Einstein equation is that viscosity is entropy density divided by 4 pi, where somehow really should have put the factor h bar in here. So the h bar is still there. And so it's the magic h bar over 4 pi that gives you the right damping of an excited black hole. So that again seemed like a very curious fact that doesn't have anything to do with anything until people made it more, more precise using something called the ADSC of C correspondence. So this correspondence that you've probably heard about many times is the claim that one can use string theory to relate two things that superficially sound like different theories. One is an ordinary field theory of the type that we're interested in, you know, quarks and gluons at some finite temperature. So that's a four-dimensional field theory. And the claim is that stuff about the four-dimensional field theory can be computed by going to what is effectively a five-dimensional, maybe ten-dimensional, but effectively five-dimensional theory, which is a purely gravitational theory, and it has the four-dimensional theory that you're interested in on its boundary. And so the five-dimensional theory is some kind of gravitational theory that lives on some particular space-time called anti the sitter space. And for us, the only thing that's relevant is that there is a claimed dictionary that takes quantities of the field theory, for example, the temperature of these quarks and gluons, and maps them onto things in the gravitational theory. So for example, in the case of the temperature, it's very straightforward. You have to put a black hole into that space time, and it's the Hawking temperature of the black hole that corresponds to the field theory temperature on the other side. And if you want to compute the entropy, for example, you just take the ordinary hawking Bekenstein entropy of that black hole. So, and what is amusing about this correspondence is that it's a weak, strong coupling correspondence. So if this theory, the ordinary field theory is strongly coupled, but quantum gravity on the other side is weakly coupled, meaning it's ordinary Einstein classical gravity, basically, okay? So this correspondence can indeed be extended to compute things like viscosity. And what happens when you do that is that, again, we already know how to do the entropy if you want to do the viscosity, of course, you do precisely this sort of experiment again, that you say send in a gravitational wave and it falls into the black hole, and that's how shear stresses get damped, and that's how the fluid on the boundary is you know, damped by shear viscosity. So this process classically just ends up being a kind of classical absorption process, which has a cross-section that's just a purely classical absorption cross-section. So as a result, the viscosity is proportional to an absorption cross-section, which is proportional to the size of the object, which is proportional to the total area of the object, which is proportional to entropy. So that eta over s is just a purely geometric thing, again, with the h-bar now. 
to eta over s in this kind of classical limit, which is the super strongly coupled limit of the field theory is one over four pi. And what we then know is that you can compute this viscosity in weak coupling by ordinary means, again, just like Boltzmann did, and you get a large number because it's one over a weakly coupled cross section. And you can compute it in the strong coupling limit, and we know that the limit is one over four pi. And then it's, of course, kind of natural to conjecture that, oh, this is sort of smoothly connected, and the one over four pi is the, is the limit. And since the one over four pi certainly looks purely geometric, people then also conjecture that maybe this is some kind of universal bound that applies not only to the theories where you can make this explicit, but to general, you know, more generally to all sorts of fluids. Okay. So the question that I want to answer is simply, you know, what do we know about this kind of experimentally when we look at systems? What kind of systems are sort of candidates for these perfect fluids and what do we know about them? And so the main systems that I want to look at in the sort of remaining 35 minutes that I have is, um, again, an extremely hot fluid, which is the core gluon plasma that I started out with. So that's temperatures of 200 MeV and more, and a super, super cold system, which is trapped atoms, which live at nanokelvin temperatures. I should admit that in the meantime, people have looked at many more quantum fluids, and this is just one of them that, of course, is much older than the other two, which is ordinary liquid helium. Now, these systems live at vastly different temperatures, and as a result, they actually have vastly, vastly different viscosities. So the viscosity of a quark gluon plasma expressed in ordinary SI units is 10 to the 11th, and that of these cold atoms is 10 to the minus 15. They differ by 26 orders of magnitude. So clearly, the only way to compare these systems is indeed to consider these ratios, like eta over s. The other thing that I find amusing about these numbers, if you look in Wikipedia and you look not for the best fluid, but for the worst fluid, meaning the highest viscosity ever measured, the thing you find is this image of a pitch drop experiment that's being conducted in Queensland since 1927. So they've observed this beaker, they've observed eight drops, and they estimate the viscosity from it, and they claim it to be roughly 10 to the 8. Pascal second. That has a name, by the way. It's called the Poise. Poise. Now, the amusing thing about this is that you see that Wikipedia is wrong because so this is about 10 to the 8. And I told you before that the quark gluon plasma is about 10 to the 11. So the most viscous fluid ever observed is not the pitch drop, but it's the quark gluon plasma. But of course, we claim that in a dimensionless sense, the quark gluon plasma is not the worst, but actually the best fluid, as we shall see, because you should clearly look at dimensionless numbers, not absolute numbers. Okay. So let me briefly say just a few things about quark gluon plasma. So this is kind of one and a half slides. So quark gluon plasma is, again, we're looking at the base diagram of quarks and gluons. In principle, there's some super simple theory that describes all you need to know about quarks and gluons. But they have a complicated phase diagram because it has to describe, you know, neutrons, protons, nuclei, neutron stars, all these really complex systems. Now, we believe that if you go to very, very high temperature or very, very high baryon density, then the quarks and gluons that are usually permanently confined in hadrons somehow bubble out and they make a plasma of quarks and gluons or out here some kind of superconducting liquid of quarks, okay? And the purpose of these experimental programs was to see whether that could indeed be observed. Now, the reason that we think that is indeed can't help but show you know, Frank's favorite function. The reason that we believe that is that QCD, which is ordinarily very strongly coupled, becomes weakly coupled at sufficiently high energy. And so if you go to high temperature, then the thermal you know, momenta and energies are large. So we expect that the theory eventually becomes weakly coupled. What that also means, by the way, is that if you look for the most strongly correlated, not the most strongly coupled system, that that would happen somewhere in between. Because so if we go to very high temperature, we think that there's quarks and gluons, and they have large momenta, and they're weakly coupled. So that should be a viscous system by what I've said. If you go to very low temperature, they're very strongly interacting. But now the interaction is so strong that they get bind, bound into color neutral states. And the residual interactions in these color neutral states are again kind of, I mean, still strong interactions, but comparatively weak. 
And so the most strongly correlated system is the one in between, somewhere near the phase transition, which is indeed where kind of the RIC program now looks. Okay. So here's historically the thing that sort of triggered the coffee mug in the beginning. And so what this experiment was, is a very simple experiment that was basically produced data on day one of the RIC program, is that we look at the collision of two heavy ions, we cannot directly aim them. So typically when they collide, they collide with some finite impact parameters. So what you see here is one heavy ion going into the plane, another one coming out of the plane. The overlap regime is kind of deformed. And if this is indeed a fluid, what you would predict is that it has some pressure and some energy density and that it gets accelerated by gradients of pressure. And gradients of pressure, of course, are bigger in the short direction and smaller in the long direction. So we predict that it explodes sideways. And if it wasn't a fluid, if it was kind of close to just particles bouncing around, of course, particles bouncing around would be mostly isotropic. A particle would not know about the shape of the system. And so this can then simply be quantified by going around the system and just counting particles. And you can typically analyze this by just looking at Fourier harmonics. So there's a zero Fourier harmonic, which would be totally round. That's this V naught. And then there's the second Fourier harmonic, which tells you how strongly deformed the final state particles are. And this is a complicated picture because it has many particle species on it. So people are more impressed because they describe not only protons, but also pions, kaons, and many other things. This is as a function of the momenta of the particles. If you make the momenta too large, then you make the gradient terms in hydro too big. So hydro is supposed to fail. Again, hydro is a long wavelength theory. So if we study hydro, we should look at the lower momenta. And these lower momenta be below sort of 2 GeV is indeed the vast majority of the particles because the temperature is something like two, 300 MeV. So all the thermal particles indeed live down here. And there's some rare particles which don't obey the rules of hydro. But what was amazing is that indeed these low momentum particles obey the rules of hydro extremely well. That indeed historically was the first time it ever really worked. And what was even more impressive is that was the simplest of all possible theories in which you completely neglect the, the effects of viscosity at all. So even totally ideal fluid dynamics works. Okay, so this was the discovery of the perfect fluid. Then of course you try to quantify it. You say, well, how much, you know, do the data require any viscosity at all and, and how much? And so that was the sort of next order. You can ask if you have some kind of prediction for this elliptic flow, how much is it modified by viscosity? And so viscosity will tend to reduce it. So there should be a minus, or here it is. So viscosity will tend to reduce it and it reduces it by some amount that's of course proportional to eta. And it goes down the more hydrodynamic the system is. So if it lives longer, this is some kind of lifetime, the effect of viscosity goes down. And again, viscous effects increase with gradients, meaning they increase with momentum of particles. And again, that was the very, very first attempt to do this where one seemed to see that viscous is actually just a little bit better than completely ideal. So there's some hint of viscosity in the data. In fact, one did see that all the sort of systematics is correct. The effects seem to grow with PT. They seem to decrease with the size of the system and so on. And they got this initial estimate, which was indeed, you see here, the best fit curve is actually super, super small in eta over S of 0.03, which if the one over four pi limit, speed limit was right, would actually be even lower than that suggested bound. But people, of course, realized that there are many details. And you know, so, so they came up with, but at the time was kind of considered a conservative bound trying to include all the errors of something like less than 0.25. So this is actually kind of old. Where this game kind of stands right now is that there's many, many more data. And in some sense, the most amusing thing, I think what was realized is that the this sort of cartoon description that I gave you before was a little too simple. That even though in the end you actually have thousands of particles, the number of colliding nucleons is not that big, you know, 100, maybe just 50. And as a result, the initial state is actually kind of inhomogeneous. It has these sort of hot spots and cold spots, just like the microwave background has hot spots and cold spots. And these hot spots and cold spots mean that the initial state does not just have elliptic deformation, it has all multiples of deformations. 
And hydro will, of course, now translate that into all multiples of expansion, of multiples of flow. And then again, viscosity actually makes a very simple prediction is that higher multiples are shorter wavelength things, so they should be more strongly dense. And that allows you actually to make an analysis that's more independent of assumptions about the initial state and so on. So you very nicely see that this, so this is elliptic flow V2, this is the third coefficient, the fourth, the fifth, and so on. And you indeed see that the higher ones are more strongly dense than the lower ones. And indeed, that roughly goes as a very simple sort of sound attenuation formula. And so these kinds of data have been used to put much tighter bounds on viscosity, which is now indeed, I don't know if I put a number somewhere, which indeed nowadays is typically these values like 0.08 that I put down here with error bars, somewhat hard to quantify, but I would say maybe plus or minus 50% at, at this point. What was also discovered, by the way, that if you go to the even higher energies, if you go to LHC, you can see, and again, that's what hydro would lead you to, to believe, that smaller and smaller systems exhibit hydrodynamic flow, that these kind of V2 coefficients that are consistent with almost ideal hydro can be seen not just in nucleus nucleus, but also in proton nucleus, and even proton proton. So you have a system that's only a Fermi across, but it shows signs of just ordinary fluid dynamics, looks just like water, okay? So I wanted to spend the kind of remaining 20 minutes to tell you something about another beautiful system that I've spent some time on, which are these ultra-cold atomic gases. And so a the to, to a theorist, that's also there's some kind of Lagrangian underneath it, it's actually a complicated atomic system made of lithium or potassium and so on. But the system is super, super dilute and it's super, super cold. And as a result, for all intents and purposes, you can think of a whole lithium atom as an elementary particle. And if it's a non-relativistic elementary particle, its only property is mass and spin. So you can write down a kind of Schrodinger Lagrangian for the system. And the system is so dilute that the com complicated interaction between the atoms can be summarized by a single delta function interaction. And the amusing thing that the atomic people can do is they can tune this interaction by applying an external magnetic field. That's some kind of atomic trick that there's some kind of coupling to an internal degree of freedom, which can be tuned by a magnetic field. And I'll show you just in a second very roughly how it works. But what it means is that the scattering length between the atoms can be tuned from all the way to infinity, so this is one over the scattering length, to weakly coupled and attractive or weakly coupled and repulsive. And what the system does is at this unitarity limit where the scattering length is infinite, it's some kind of high temperature superfluid, it's an ordinary fluid above CC and then becomes superfluid below that. And in the more weakly coupled regime, it becomes a superfluid only at very, very low temperature. So this limit of infinite scattering lengths is kind of an amusing limit. So I wanted to spend another two minutes on it. So one way to think about it is again, undergraduate quantum mechanics, you have some kind of potential well and it's attractive. And in the language of scattering theory, we, we call that negative scattering length. If you make it more attractive, eventually a bound state will appear. And initially it appears with zero binding energy and that then corresponds to infinite scattering lengths because now the bound state wave function has an infinitely long tail. And you make it even more attractive, the bound state now has finite energy and the scattering length has changed sign. So even though this is a, an attractive potential, the scattering actually looks repulsive. So the system that we're now studying is a system where effectively we've taken that bound state at threshold and we made the potential of shorter and shorter range. In reality, we do it by making it more and more dilute. We make it of shorter and shorter range, but we make it deeper at the same time so that the bound state always stays at threshold. And then in this limit, we arrive at this amusing kind of system which has an infinite scattering length, a zero effective range, and a zero bound state energy. It's a very strongly correlated system, but it's completely parameter free. All the relevant physical parameters are either zero or infinite. So it's a kind of pure math problem. And what happens in this limit is that it has many universal features. So for example, the scattering amplitude between the two particles now becomes simply one over IK. And so that's, the system is called the unitary Fermi gas because that's the unitarity limited S-wave scattering cross-sections. 
It's in some sense the strongest S-wave interaction that quantum mechanics allows. And so this then, of course, kind of a natural system for looking at good fluids. It's a very strongly correlated, very dilute fluid. Here, by the way, is a little kind of sort of one minute on the experimental trick, what we actually do. And so there's some kind of potential between these atoms, which in fact is a sort of Van der Waals potential at long distances because these are neutral atoms. Now, these neutral atoms, of course, have complicated internal structure. There are, for example, other hyperfine states that are not occupied, but the states in principle are there. Now, these states often have a different magnetic moment from the state that the electron is actually in. And what that means is that when you apply a magnetic field, you can move this up and down relative to the state in which the electrons actually are. Now, there are many, many states in that potential, you know, rotational, vibrational states. But if you tune it just right, you can get one of them to be resonant with the state that the electrons are actually in. And of course, quantum mechanically, there will always be some tunneling probability between these levels. In practice, it's actually very, very small, but it doesn't matter. It's going to be resonant anyway. It will just mean that the resonance is very narrow. And so that narrow resonance is called the Feshbach resonance, the weak tunneling resonance. So the electrons actually spend essentially no time in this state. So to the outside world, that state is invisible. It just gets imprinted into this infinite scattering length. And so this is an actual experiment that shows that this does indeed happen. So these, again, are atoms that you know, have now scattering lengths of thousands of angstroms, so much, much larger than the atom itself. In reality, by the way, this is complicated atomic physics. So the actual state, I think, in lithium is like the 37th vibrational state in some S9. You know, I don't understand any of it, but again, it just looks like non relativistic particles with infinite scattering. These particles make kind of an amusing fluid because it's completely scale invariant. So if you make a fluid of these particles with infinite scattering length, then one way to think of this is a sort of pedestrian way of thinking about it is that in reality, in practice, sort of effectively, the scattering is, of course, not really infinite. Eventually, you run into some other particle and many body effects set in. So I tend to think of the system as sort of balloons that expand until they touch and then all particles somehow interact with one another. If you take a system like this and you let it expand, you think that it's becoming colder and even more dilute so that it would be less interacting. But that's not actually the case because this, the balloons will simply expand with it. That's sort of scale invariant. But the effective interaction between the particles will just grow to keep up with the diluteness of the system. So a system like this, even though it's super dilute in these experiments, it's a million atoms in some area that's maybe a micron across is basically a good vacuum. It's actually a very good fluid, and it's a fluid no matter how dilute. You can let it expand forever, and at least in the ideal world, it would still be a fluid. So in the lingo of the heavy iron people, this system doesn't freeze out ever. Practice, of course, eventually does. So here's the experiment that got the people in the heavy iron community kind of excited because they finally could see but these heavy ion experiments you only infer. So this again, it's about a few hundred thousand lithium atoms in an optical trap so it's the focus of a laser beam. And this is just an image that's taken literally with this sort of you know, digital camera. You just look down through the system. And so as I mentioned, this is maybe a few microns or something like that. And so this is a deformed system because it sits in the focus of a laser beam, which is some kind of confining potential that's naturally elongated. And then the experiment is simply we flip the switch on the laser beam. So we turn this confining laser field off. And if the system is a fluid, then the same argument I gave previously applies, that there's a pressure gradient in the short direction and somewhat larger than the pressure gradient in the long direction. So it should explode sideways. And you see on the figures that indeed it does. So the scale doesn't change. They're all on the same scale. So you can see that there's hardly any expansion in the long direction, but it expands in the short direction. And a typical observable would then simply be to measure these two radii. So the radius in the long direction stays kind of constant, and the radius in the short direction quickly grows. Well, another way to look at it is that you measure the aspect ratio, so the ratio of the two radii starts small, becomes round, and then becomes deformed the other way. And so number one, you see here, so the data, actual data, 
this line, again, is completely ideal fluid dynamics. You see that you're already close to the data, but maybe not quite. And you can also see that in the system, you can control the strength of the interaction. So if I make it weakly interacting by changing that magnetic field, then the data change from the red points to the blue points, and that looks totally different. Now the system just asymptotically becomes round. Okay. So clearly the strong interactions are somehow needed to see the fluid dynamic behavior. Okay. So in principle, this should be very simple to analyze and actually thought sort of many years ago, I would just do this over the weekend and I compare these data with this Navier-Stokes theory and then I would know what eta over s is. So the details turned out to be more complicated and the main problem is this one, that the, the gas cloud, and that happens in the heavy ions too, is that it contains a fluid dynamic core, but it contains just a few atoms on the outside that don't really make it fluid. It's just a very dilute gas. And the system is kind of expanding into that dilute corona. Now, you might think that there's just a few atoms. Who cares? We just, you know, we're making a small mistake, but if it's a thousand atoms out of a million, then what do I care? Now, the trouble is that indeed the Navier-Stokes equation is some kind of expansion in gradient. And if you force it into a regime where it's not supposed to work, then bad things can happen to you. And in fact, bad things do start to happen because, for example, the total amount of heat that's being dissipated is proportional to viscosity times gradients of the velocity squared. And even where there is no atoms, there is still velocity. There's in fact an approximately linear velocity profile. And we already learned that for a dilute gas, the viscosity is independent of density. So even if there is no atoms, there's still viscosity. So these, if they have kind of two atoms on the outside, they dissipate more heat than the entire, if I just run Navier-Stokes, dissipate more heat than the fluid in the middle. Now, again, that's not a physical problem. It's just a problem of using a theory outside the domain where it's supposed to work. But it still needs to be addressed because you can't just cut it off by hand. Then your determination of viscosity is effectively just a determination of how big you believe the volume is where fluid dynamics works. And so now the solution that I settled on actually kind of like, so this is maybe my one more technical slide. And I include it because it took me many years to decide that this is the way to go, which is I take a hydrodynamic theory that I call hydro plus plus. So in addition to these conserved charges, I propagate a few more things that are not actually conserved. Because hydro is universal, that actually changes nothing for a fluid. So as I explained earlier, if I propagate something that's not conserved, it just relaxes more quickly than the conserved charges the thermal equilibrium, and it changes nothing. It's just Navier-Stokes with unnecessary extra effort. However, if I judiciously pick these extra charges that I'm propagating in such a way that they know about the free streaming limit, so that it's a quantity that becomes conserved, not for a real fluid, but for a non-interacting fluid, then I ensure that my hydrodynamic theory just smoothly extrapolates to the non-interacting limit. And so hydro plus plus, it's officially sometimes called anisotropic hydro, it's just a theory with the hydrodynamic theory with a bunch of extra variables that not only has the fluid dynamics built in, but also the dilute gas built in. And that's a much more stable theory, and it can be used to analyze these systems where you go from very dense in the middle to very dilute on the outside with just one theory. So here's where we are currently with these systems. So we now have actual experiments where the experimentalist, which is actually a colleague of mine at NC State, his name is John Thomas, who does these exper experiments. He has multiple cameras so that he looks at the gas from all sides. So he actually measures not just one aspect ratio, but multiple aspect ratios. And it's now very, very fine grained as a function of the initial energy of the cloud. That's just a measure of the initial temperature. And so he measures a variety of aspect ratios. Here I just plot one. And so what I overlay here is a bunch of data that are effectively at different temperatures, where this is high temperature and this is low temperature. And I describe it by a theory where I took the viscosity and made a kind of fugacity or virial expansion. So it has a leading high temperature term and then the leading, then the first correction at low temperature, the next correction at low temperature, and so on. And so 
And you see that the leading order theory indeed only fits at the highest temperatures, and then the next to leading order theory starts to fit at the lower temperatures and so on. So effectively what this shows is that viscosity has non-trivial uh, temperature intensity dependence. Okay. So one amusing thing about this analysis, which is very hard in the heavy iron case, is that I can sort of benchmark the whole thing because I can look at very high temperatures, much larger than Tc, where even at unitarity, it eventually just becomes a weakly interacting gas. And in that limit, I can use good old Boltzmann's theory to predict what I should see. And the prediction what I should see is that the viscosity scales as temperature to the three halves with the known coefficient that I can work out from Boltzmann's equation, which in numbers is 0.269. And I can analyze the experiment at very high temperature. That was my sort of initial fit. And you see that this is within, I don't know, four or five percent. And I claim that for a transport measurement in a quantum fluid, this is a really, really good job. Nobody ever does a job this good on a real quantum fluid in doing transport. So it's a sort of benchmark for the whole method. And then I can take it down to lower temperatures and let me maybe focus on the part, on the, there's too many curves over here. So the part on the right is just eta over S. And um, for now I actually restricted my analysis to just above the superfluid transition because at the superfluid transition, other stuff starts to happen, which is a sort of separate talk. But what is amusing is that the data actually indicate that the minimum eta over S indeed happens slightly above it. And these are, by the way, various theory curves. So this is a high temperature theory curve. This is a kind of low temperature one. And you see that the minimum seems to be, you know, an eta over S is about 0.4-ish, 0.5-ish maybe. So this is indeed a little bit bigger by about a factor of four or so than the quark gluon plasma. But again, in terms of ratios, it's really remarkably close given that the absolute figures differ by many, many orders of magnitude. So this is a kind of very general conclusion, but I still find it remarkable that, again, we now have eta over S numbers for a whole bunch of quantum fluids. As best as I can tell, it's still true that um, the lowest numbers that we've reliably seen are kind of for the hottest system, which is the quark gluon plasma, and kind of the coldest system, which are these ultra-cold gases. And both of these systems really come remarkably close. The quark gluon plasma are actually super close, you know, within a few percent the cold gases within factors of three or four to this funny bound of one over four pi that originally came out of string theory. And that I believe in the end was somehow explains the success of hydrodynamics in these very small, very quickly evolving systems is indeed the fact that kind of quantum limited viscosity and quantum limited relaxation can give you the required super short relaxation time so that you can get to hydro very quickly. I wanted to include a sort of 20 second advertisement for something else that we're currently trying to do. So this is a little topical collaboration that we have that we call BEST. It's the beam energy scan theory collaboration. And what we're trying to do is that there is a belief that in this case diagram that I showed earlier, there could be a critical endpoint which is kind of analogous to the endpoint of the liquid gas phase transition in ordinary water vapor. And so there's a hope that by changing the beam energy on these heavy ion collisions, you could generate a couple of trajectories that would eventually pass close by this critical point. And again, this is an amusing hydro problem because what should happen near that critical point is some form of critical opalescence. But again, this critical opalescence in a very dynamical kind of framework because the system is actually exploding. You know, this giant explosion of a quark gluon plasma as it's passing to that point. So in principle, the correlation lengths will grow and there's all these universal phenomena, but it's actually very quickly evolving so that you can't quite get to the universal point. But again, that should be described by fluid dynamics and it should be described by kind of fluctuating fluid dynamics. Fluid dynamics with thermal fluctuations included with an equation of state that allows them to grow very large. It's a theory that's in principle kind of known how it works, but it's never really been used in relativistic systems that hasn't really been numerically studied. So we're currently trying to develop this theory of kind of fluctuating fluid dynamics in the hope of maybe locating this point. So thank you very much.
Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would of course argue that morally yeah, that's so the so the first comment I would make is that the beauty of the cold gases is that morally it's the same system that you're talking about. Because the point I realized with the cold gases is non relativistic fermions at infinite scattering length. And it so happens in nature, there's another system where by accident, the scattering length is very large, and that's neutrons. So the neutron is a particle about a Fermi across with a scattering length that's twi almost 20 Fermi. And so for all intents and purposes in finite systems, that's infinite. And so to the extent that your system is just neutrons at infinite scattering lengths, it's exactly the same as this. And then real nuclear matter is, you know, just slightly different. It's neutrons and protons, and it's not quite infinite. But given that it's so close, it's not shocking. That's, you know, that's the beauty of universality, that indeed that's what it is. Uh, with regard to bulk viscosity, so if you actually are in precisely this limit where the range is zero and the scattering length is infinite, again, it's truly scaling there. And it's an actual informal field theory if you want to sound fancy. And so that system has no bulk viscosity because it's, again, invariant under scaling. And that's actually been checked. Now, in principle, it should develop a bulk viscosity once you deform it away from unitarity. And I have a prediction for how that should happen, but that's turned out to be difficult to check because the numbers end up being kind of smallish. In the heavy ions, there are indeed a number of attempts, and I've made one myself, to determine bulk viscosity, but it's a more complicated game because there is no one observable that's quite as clean as the sheer, as the sort of as these elliptic flow data, and so it tends to be then kind of global fits where a lot of data go into the final determination, and it's a little hard to say how accurate the result is. Yeah, so in the heavy ions, people indeed are sort of historically used to having to do this, and they solve it in some ways sort of brute force numerically that you have a hydrodynamic description that's coupled to a transport description based on kinetic theory. Now, the thing that's a little, that's actually kind of complicated in practice, you need two complicated codes, and there has to be some kind of interface, but it's, it's still easier than the code gases because in the heavy ions, it's at least approximately true that the system just kind of freezes out at some time or some temperature, so that you run the hydro until that temperature, and then you switch and you run kinetics. And you never have to let particles sort of go back and forth between kinetics and fluid. And that's the part that's harder about the cold gases, that it expands into this corona, and so I need to let them go both ways. And so I thought about the, the sort of heavy iron strategy for a while and decided it was somewhat too complicated. And too much to risk. But yes, the problem there exists there too. Mm -hmm. So in the, in the case of the heavy ions, so in principle, 
the transport properties are strong functions of the temperature. Except, so for example, even in weak coupling, the viscosity goes as temperature to the fourth, and so that's the entropy density. So the little miracle that happens at very high temperatures in that plasma phase is that the ratio is approximately constant, as much as we can tell. Now, once you go from quarks and gluons to ordinary hadrons, it becomes a very strong function. Even that ratio is now a very strong function of temperature. And we indeed believe that eventually these hadrons are somewhat weakly interacting, and it would become very large. Now, the data, of course, is an integral over the time history of the system. It starts out very hot and dense, and then it cools. And in the heavy ions, you don't have to, you know, you don't have the pictures of the whole evolution. You only have the endpoint integrated over the whole thing. And so, in practice, the only strategy right now is to effectively assume that we know how the hadrons interact and put that information in, in the form of some kind of transport code, and leave as a free parameter that we determine from the experiment as what happened in the plasma phase. Now, ideally, we would like to measure the whole thing. Now, but the problem is, again, the one that I mentioned, which is that once the viscosity becomes kind of largish, you need a bigger and bigger system to reliably measure it. And we only have, you know, nuclei of a given size. They don't come in infinitely large. So the, the part where the viscosity becomes very large, I think, is sort of unmeasurable in practice. It might actually be measurable in neutron stars that you have these sort of uh, modes. You know, there's these famous R modes and T modes and God knows what. And we believe that they're probably damped by some combination of shear and bulk. And if LIGO ever sees a damping R mode, we would actually of know what the viscosity of a neutron star is. So maybe one of these days we'll see that. Thank you. Um, den, den habe ich einfach da drauf geladen, der kann da einfach bleiben. Na, ob ich ihn irgendwie abschalten kann. Yeah, it's actually still on that computer. Yeah. Can I have someone come So I don't know. Here it is. If you know how to send something from, I mean, if not, send me an email, and then, or you can figure out how to get it off of there. Yeah, if there's a browser, you can go. Yeah, I'm walking off with the microphone. <laughs>